here. Our recess lasted a little bit longer than we anticipated due to votes. Um, I now yield five minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. Dr. Singer, in your testimony, you talked about the market demand for fentanyl, for drugs generally, but specifically for fentanyl. Uh, and I, I guess I wanted to assess the utility of that analysis in the context of a drug that is often spliced into other things that people are using. Um, Ma'am, did, did your son seek out fentanyl? Was he part of the market demand for fentanyl? Absolutely not. He bought a pill on Snapchat, a blue Perk 30, and it, it had fentanyl in it. And, and Mr. Maltz, in, in your extensive experience at DEA, you know, do you find that fentanyl is being laced into uh, what people believe to be Percocet? 100%, yes. And, and Xanax as well? Yes, sir. And marijuana? Uh, there are cases of marijuana. We don't know the extent of that, but there have been Fatalities reported with fentanyl in marijuana, and yes. MDMA and ecstasy? Do we Not see sure that? about too much of that, but definitely in heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine. But more importantly, it's the pure fentanyl that's in the pills and the powder. And they're making these pills, millions of them every day. There's, there's pill press locations. Well, I, I get if someone, I get that you would think about something as an overdose. If someone was seeking out fentanyl, they believed they were taking a certain amount of it, they end up taking more, and they end up overdosing. But if someone thinks that they're using a different substance, that doesn't strike me as an overdose, that strikes me as a poisoning. It, 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 does, it, yeah, Dr. Singer, I'd, I'd love your, your thoughts on it, because yeah. probably on the Republican side, I am the easiest to concur that the war on drugs is one that has been won by drugs. Yeah, well, uh, Congressman Gates, uh, you, maybe you misunderstood me. There is, there are some people who actually want fentanyl, but for the most part, it's prohibition and the black market that it created that is responsible for this. Because as I mentioned about the iron law of prohibition, that is what incentivizes the cartels to come up with more potent forms. So initially, around 2012 or so, we were seeing fentanyl appear as a mixture with heroin to increase, to boost its potency so that they could smuggle it in smaller amounts and sell it into more units. Then it really got accelerated when the cartels realized it's easier to synthesize. You don't have to rely on the opium poppy being shipped. And, and the reason why we're seeing so many innocent people who are, for example, buying a, a Percocet, they think, even Prince, Prince, he liked to use Vicodin. And his dealer, he thought his dealer got him Vicodin, but the toxicology reports showed he died of a fentanyl overdose. It wasn't in, the, in those cases that people were seeking fentanyl. It's that this is what happens when you have a black market. Sure. So, so, uh, so I, wanted, I wanted to ask you a little bit about those relationships between the dealers and um, the users. I found a tweet of yours from back in 2019 where you say, when people cross political borders, they're not violating anyone's rights, given that they are simply exercising their natural God-given rights of freedom of travel, economic liberty, freedom of contract, and freedom of association. When you say freedom of contract, like, are you talking about the contract between the drug traffickers and the users? No, I'm talking about a contract, for example, between a, a farmer and somebody uh, who has, is offering to work on their farm and help pick crops, for example. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the farmer because we were just in Yuma, Arizona, and we met with a lot of the growers. These are like third, fifth generation growers. And what, what they tell us about their freedoms and, and their property rights, property rights that I think Cato cares deeply about, is that they get violated by migrants who uh, defecate in their fields, who create contamination for the food supply. And these are not insurable losses. So they just have to, to eat these losses. And like, do, do, does the violation of the property rights of the farmers you mentioned of course. concern you? That would be trespassing. On private property, so right. But don't you think that the open borders policies that you've advocated for uh, increase the frequency of that violation of people's property rights? Um, people have no right to come on someone else's property without their permission. Um, I'm not here as an immigration expert, but I can tell you as a libertarian, uh, the overarching overarching principle is that uh, fun our fundamental inalienable rights are not limited to people in the United States. It's a human. Phenomenon. Oh. All humans, and all humans have the right to freedom of movement. But not across somebody else's property, right? I beg your pardon? Not across somebody's private property. Not private do think, property, no. Do you think that everybody in the world has freedom of movement across our border? Unfortunately, no. But you would like that to be? Well, I think borders are for governments, and uh, 
Uh, not for people. I don't know, Dr. Sir, is I, that define see, where I would observe that was. governments have to govern the conduct of people, and that the role of our government is to secure our border, and that if it's open, it's the property rights you're concerned about and the life and health of our fellow Americans that continues to degrade. But I, I appreciate the colloquy and appreciate all the witnesses being here. I yield back.